Legacy enemies. I don't know if any of you have people in your life who you just don't get along with. I don't know if we would say it'd be like oil and water, right? There's just this friction that I have with this this person. This today's conversation might be for you if if you do have those people in your life. So today's conversation, legacy enemies, and in and in our verses, what I want you to look for is there really there are three behaviors that the Pharisees are guilty of practicing that Jesus warns them and really basically warns us to avoid uh, practicing in our own life. So try to identify them. We're going to start reading at verse 48, or rather 45, Luke chapter 19, verse 45. So Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people selling anim- animals for sacrifices. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be turned Well, my temple will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. After that, he taught daily in the temple. Check that out. After that, he taught daily in the temple, but the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the other leaders of the people began planning how to kill him. But they could think of nothing, because all the people hung on every word he said. You all know the context of these Bible verses, don't you? You know, by this time in in Jesus' ministry, he's one popular dude with the people, not so much with the Jewish religion leaders. And prior to this uh, temple cleansing experience that we just read about, if you just go back a few verses, and those of you who were here last weekend for our conversation, we're told how Jesus uh, rides into into Jerusalem. Remember that story on a donkey, in essence, declaring himself to be king, while the people cheer on and applaud Jesus' sort of this public declaration that he makes. Upon arrival in Jerusalem, it shouldn't surprise us then to read that Jesus immediately heads to the temple where he intends, I think, at first glance to do some spiritual teaching, but when he arrives on scene, what Jesus sees causes him to pop a cork, to blow a gasket, so to speak. I don't know if Jesus is face was flushed or red in color. I don't know if the veins in his neck were popping out. The Bible writer doesn't say. But what we are told here in these verses that we read is that Jesus cleans house, doesn't he? The Bible said instead of the temple being filled with worshipers, what he finds is a group of individuals selling animals for sacrifice. Now, as most of you likely know, according to the Jewish religion guidelines, the sacrifice of animals was necessary for the forgiveness of sins. You know, the Old Testament a system of forgiveness, which God the Father had initiated and set up with the nation of Israel the, with, through Moses, you know, when they were leaving uh, the, the, their Egyptian captivity, really involved the sacrifice of an animal, life for life, to pay the penalty for a person's sin. And so Jesus ultimately changed that when he went to the cross, right, to shed his blood uh, for for you and for me. But prior to Jesus' activity on the cross, animal sacrifices were necessary. And so to help assist these temple goers with this worship sacrifice, particularly those who lived outside of the area, the Jewish priests, they would contract with ranchers to, to provide animals for the people to buy to be used for this sin offering. It was a, it was a practice that likely had, had been going on for centuries, hundreds and hundreds of years. The problem, though, with this system, which is what made Jesus so upset, is that these priests saw this animal purchasing agreement as a way to earn a little extra cash for themselves. You know, the Jewish priests had an important role in the spiritual lives of the people. And yet what we read here, as Jesus points out, is they they abused their responsibility. You know, what likely started out as a ministry that served the needs, the spiritual needs of these people turned into this profiteering, money-gouging enterprise. It's what we would typically call a supply and demand scenario, right? The demand for animals to be used for sacrifice was high, and so with that came exorbitant prices. And herein lies, brothers and sisters, the first legacy enemy 
that you and I should be on guard against. It's what I'm calling legacy greed. Legacy greed, point number one in your app notes. Legacy greed is a poison we must all be on guard against. Friends, how do you define greed? Well, this is my de definition. I think greed is an insatiable desire for more. Greed is an insatiable and unquenchable desire for more. You know, I don't know if, if, if any of you would agree with me on this or not, but in my opinion, gluttony is a synonym for greed. You know, when Joe offers me one cookie to eat, I want two cookies to eat. Bacon. When he gives me one slice of bacon, I want two slices, right? When my employer gives me a nice bonus or raise, suddenly I feel like I deserve more, right? And instead of maintaining the same level or the same standard of living with that little extra that comes my way, what do I do? I raise my expenses, don't I? What I was originally living off of no longer satisfies. And friend, I'm suggesting that greed is a poison that will tarnish your life. You know, Jesus once preached, if you have two coats to wear, share one with another. If someone asks you to walk with them one mile, you should walk two miles with them. Do a little bit extra for your neighbor, not less, which is the opposite of greed. If your enemy asks you for a cup of cold water, not only give it to them cheerfully, but give it with them uh, with some a glass of ice next to it to help make it even colder, right? You know, sisters and brothers, there's nothing wrong with making a little profit for your hard effort and extra, you know, hard work. It's just that we don't love our neighbors when we gouge them financially. And so with God's help, I think part of the one of the transferable concepts of this conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples of that day is for you and I to ask God for help to say no to greed. Okay, so let's do that right now. So let's say a prayer together. Put your palms out if you can and just take a deep breath and just, again, it's a way to center down. Take a deep breath in, hold it, and then exhale. Now pray this in your heart and mind. Say, Jesus, please forgive me when I'm greedy. Please forgive me when I'm gluttonous. And please nurture in me an increased capacity to be generous. Deep breath in. Hold it. Exhale. Good. Okay. Let's keep reading. Chapter 20, verse 1. One day as Jesus was teaching the people and preaching the good news in the temple... The leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders came up to him. They demanded, by what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right? Skip down to verse 9. Now Jesus turned to the people again, and he told them this story. A man planted a vineyard, leased it to the tenant farmers, and moved to another country to live for several years. At the time of the great harvest, he sent one of his servants to collect his share of the crop, but the farmers attacked the servant, beat him up, and sent him back empty-handed. So the owner sent another servant, but they also insulted him, beat him up, and sent him away empty-handed. A third man was sent, and they wounded him and chased him away. What will I do? The owner asked himself. I know. I'll send my cherished son. Surely they will respect him. But when the tenant farmers saw his son, they said to each other, here comes the heir to hit this estate. Let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they dragged him out of the vineyard and murdered him. You see the short foreshadowing here of Jesus' story with the cross? What do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do to them? Jesus asked. I'll tell you. He will come and kill those farmers and lease the vineyard to others. 
How terrible that such a thing should ever happen, his listeners protested. Then Jesus looked at them and said this, Then what does this scripture mean? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Everyone who stumbles over that stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone who it falls on. The teachers of religious law and the leading priests wanted to arrest Jesus immediately because they realized he was telling the story against them. They were the wicked farmers, but they were afraid of the people's reaction. Now write this down, legacy enemy number two. A second legacy enemy I propose that we can see identified here in Jesus' story is what I'm calling pomposity infused with entitlement. Pomposity entitled or infused with entitlement. Have you ever described someone or heard someone described as a pompous ass? And I'm not talking about a donkey. When a person is pompous, what behaviors do they generally display? How might they carry themselves? A pompous person might act bombastic. By the way, that's a good word of the day. So you have to use that word this week, bombastic. Let's say it all together. Bombastic, okay. So a pompous person might act bombastic with an overbearing ego and an air of self-importance. Uh, a pompous person kind of carries themselves with this I'm better than you persona. Have you ever met anybody like that? Have you yourself ever acted like that? You know, have you ever heard anyone self-proclaim, I'm kind of a big deal around here. And therefore, I deserve special treatment, right? I'm entitled to gold star handling. Sisters and brothers, we're all created in the image of God, yes? In fact, on the crown of three, let me see, hear you say out loud together in unison the word all. You ready? One, two, three. Oh, we are all created in the image of God. And so while that's certainly a reason enough for you and I to have a healthy self-esteem, and you and I should have a healthy self-esteem, we should embrace it. It doesn't mean that we have to be arrogant about it. Every person is created in God's image. You know, in Jesus' day, the religious leaders were pompous to the hilt. Which is why Jesus compares them to this group of tenant farmers who felt entitled to the share of crop that rightful, rightfully belonged to the owner of the vineyard that they were leasing from. That crop didn't belong to them, did it? And translation here is the temple ministry that these Pharisees had been entrusted to this temple ministry that the Pharisees enjoyed wasn't for their use, for their own benefit. They were stewards. You know, it's like, for those of you, I don't know if some of you have, you know, uh, business accounts. Like you have, a, you know, an expense account. When you use your expense account, do you realize that you're actually spending shareholder money? You know, that's a big deal. You know, we, I, it's, a, it's a huge value of mine. I, I'm, you know, any staff over the course of a, the history of our church, I'm like, you guys, we have to be very careful about how we use this money because this is the people's money. This is God's money. And so if you have a choice between ordering water or a Coke, order water. Have your Coke at home. Save the three bucks to give be used for something else. Are you with me? It's a decision. We're called stewards. And these Pharisees were not paying attention to that. And so Jesus warned them that because they had abused their authority, the judgment day was on the horizon. Now let's bring it to our day. 
I wonder how many people are pushed away from faith because of selfish, pompous pastors. You know, anybody here today or maybe tuning in online ever been a victim of a pompous, entitled pastor? You know, my responsibility, as I shared earlier, as a pastor, is to exhort and motivate and raise up, not to use and abuse. At church, I hope I'm doing okay on that. But with God's help, you know, I want to be a servant leader, not an entitled one. And really, that should be the hope for all of us, yes? God calls us to wash people's feet, not demand that others do that for us. And so let's say another prayer. We'll call it a pompous entitlement prayer, okay? So put your palms out. Take a deep breath in again. Just kind of breathe in. Hold it for a moment. As long as you can feel comfortable. And then exhale. Now pray this in your heart. Say, Jesus, please forgive me when I adopt an entitlement attitude. And please empower me to serve and to put other people's needs ahead of my own. Deep breath in. Exhale. Good. So let's land the plane. So after lambasting these Jewish religion leaders, Jesus turns his attention back to his disciples. And if you skip all the way down to the end of this chapter, to verse 45, notice what Jesus writes, and we'll close on this. With the crowds listening, Jesus turned to his disciples and said, Beware these teachers of religious law, for they like to parade around in flowing robes and love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces and how they love the seats of honor in the synagogues and the head table at banquets. Yet they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property and then pretend to be pious by, ma by making long prayers in public. Because of this, they will be severely punished. Now herein lies our third legacy enemy that Jesus warns us about. It's what I'm calling the enemy of masquerading. The enemy of masquerading. You know, have you, any of you ever been to a masquerade party, show of hands, maybe like at a Halloween time where you put on a costume, right? You put on a, a mask maybe to try to pretend to be somebody. You take on the appearance of another person. You kind of pretend to be anyone who, somebody else but not yourself. It's kind of like, in my opinion, Joe Biden right now pretending to be United States president. That's a good joke, huh? That's a good joke. St. Patrick's Day. I know. Forget it. I knew I, that was a risk. It's a risk. Please don't leave. Please don't leave. <laughs> Jesus challenged his disciples, brothers and sisters. He challenged his disciples to live authentically. Don't pretend to be one person with a group of friends and be another person with another group of friends. Are you with me? When Jesus... When a person, you know, this, is, you, this is an easy question to answer. When a person preaches one thing and does another thing, we call that a what? A hypocrite, right? Would you turn to your neighbor and say, don't be fake? Tell them, don't be fake. You know, I have a friend, and I warned him because we talked already today. I have a friend, and he's probably watching online, so I'll just wave right now who has a bad habit by his own admission, and I agree with him, which is why I'm using this in an illustration today. He has this bad habit of saying, well, to be honest, and then he makes this, this comment, right? And then he'll, he'll often say, oh, you know, I, I'm always honest. I don't know why. I got to stop saying that, to be honest, before I say something, you know, try to emphasize something, because I'm always honest, and I would agree. I've never known them to lie. I've never known him to wear a mask. I've never known him to be to tell, tell a falsehood, and yet he has this bad habit of saying, well, to be honest, as if everything else he's been saying has been what? Dishonest, right? Jesus calls his followers to live authentically. We shouldn't have to say to be honest, 
Are you with me? Because we should be honest all the time anyways. But the Pharisees, the temple leaders in Jesus' day, were not. And so, sisters and brothers, what Jesus wanted his disciples to know, what he wants you and me to know, is let your yes be yes and your no be no. Tell the truth. No emphasis needed. Are you with me? Humble yourself. Take ownership for what you do and say. Pay the consequences if there are any. And then with God's help, move forward. I think that's just, that describes a Christian life to a T. We go to the Lord, we say, Lord, I'm a, I'm a sinner, please forgive me. And Jesus says, well, all right. I can't wait, I want to. But he doesn't want us to live in, in what that mistake was. He's like, get up and, and keep, keep moving forward. That's what honesty is. That's one reason why Jesus died on the cross, to give us a fresh start. So I think one of the takeaways, the transferable concepts that we can grab from this story is the emphasis to say no to masquerading. So personalize this. In your world... Where might you be tempted to wear a mask? At work? At school? Here at church? You know, do you walk into this place sometimes with your Jesus face on, but inside you're really hurting and maybe angry at the person you just walked in the door with? There's got to be some level of authenticity, you know? Accountability. Say no to masquerading. Be transparent, even at the risk of being misunderstood. Don't be fake. With God's help, try to live authentically. You see, the Pharisees in Jesus' day were not genuine. They pretended to be spiritual. They pretended to love God. But Jesus saw through their duplicity, didn't he? And when he called them out, rather than repent and go, oh, you got us, Jesus. Good one. You're right. What did they do? They doubled down. They got defensive. They said, you know what? We got to silence this guy. Nobody talks to me like that. And there's a little bit of that in me. I know. And I suspect there might be a little bit of that in some of you too. So Jesus taught that for the, these Pharisees, God the Father was going to bring punishment. Why? Because masquerading, masquerading is a legacy enemy. And so brothers and sisters, with God's help, strive to be transparent with your heart motives. Can you do that? Let me hear you say yes. 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 So let's say another prayer and we'll end on this. Hands open. Heart open. Mind open. Say, Jesus, please forgive me when I preach one thing but practice something else. Jesus, please help me to live authentically and without a mask. This is my legacy prayer in your name. And everybody said, amen. Would you please stand? I want to offer you one final blessing. Hands open. We'll call it the St. Patrick's birthday blessing. Brothers and sisters today, I bless you with an increased measure of self-awareness to live authentically, to not be fake, to not wear masks, but to live with the confidence that God has made you and he's at work in you. 
He's not done with you yet. So live this week with a greater sense of self-awareness. I bless you, my sisters and brothers, in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen and amen.